So our next speaker this morning is uh, Laura Baldwin. Uh, for those of you that don't know Laura, Laura is the president of O'Reilly Media. And today Laura's gonna talk about how pivots are overrated and how small changes can unlock markets. Please welcome Laura. Great venue. Uh, O'Reilly puts on conferences all over the world, and uh, I have to say, this is funner than what we do, so we've got to take back some new ideas. want to talk about pivots being overrated and small changes, and I'm actually going to use some of my own experiences of companies that I've been at. Um, I confess that I actually don't like the word pivot, and the reason I don't like it is as part of O'Reilly, we actually own a small venture capital firm, OATV, and we do startup days at most of our events. And I sit down with a lot of these uh, startups saying, and they're telling me what their business model is gonna be. And then the next thing they say is, but here's what we're thinking about for our pivot if we have to pivot. And it's, it really gets me mad because you're sitting there thinking, what are we gonna do if we fail? Now, I love the fact that they're thinking about the future, but the reality is they're planning on failure up front. And what makes me crazy is that it almost is you can't see what's happening right in front of you when you take that attitude. So Tim O'Reilly talks a lot about William Gibbons' statement, right? The future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. If that's true, then this is the time startups need to pay attention. Not be thinking about what if this doesn't work, but how do we actually make this work? So I'm going to go back to 1994, and I'm looking in this audience. Some of you might not even have been born. I'm the CFO and EBP of a company called Chronicle Books. It was one of the publishing divisions of Chronicle Publishing, which was a billion-dollar company in San Francisco. And publishing was starting to feel the effects of the digital revolution. Now, that seems funny back in 94, but we were really watching and paying attention. We were starting to see book sales erode. Amazon had just come on the scene in July of that year, and let me tell you something, by September, every publisher knew what that was gonna mean. Authors were demanding many more things. This was the days when publishing companies were in charge of securing permissions and doing all of the legal work that over the years has now been put on authors. So this was sort of the beginning of this digital transa uh, transition that we were going to. But Chronicle was still growing. I'm really proud to say we were one of the first publishers that actually paid attention to communities in ways that many publishers don't. They think of themselves as a book publisher, and that's what they do, and they don't understand their audiences because publishing and books are actually sold through third-party providers, right? Barnes & Noble has the customer. Amazon has the customer, not you. But we were developing a new children's line and we were hiring some talent. We hired a, a woman named Carolyn Herter out of Simon & Schuster who had built a billion dollar art and photography business at Simon & Schuster. We were investing significantly at the time in legal, right? And it's so funny because one of the things I hear from startups at the O'Reilly events is they kind of think about that later. They think about legal later. Well, when you're in a legacy business, you don't get to think about it later. It's part of what you do. So we were investing in legal, but at the same time, technology was changing. Everybody talks about how great it is to, to actually print your books over in China. Well, things like die cuts, like the photo that you see there, we're starting to change that dynamic and we're making it much more expensive. So back in 94, 95, we were seeing profits erode. So what did we do? The publishing model was in transition. You all are aware that it still is, only much deeper than it was back then. And the market conditions made us really question our future. Are we going to be a publisher? Digital was not a competency. We knew that we had to change. In today's language, from what I hear with startups, they'd be saying, oh, we've got to pivot. Well, no. It's not about looking at things and completely changing your business model. I don't believe in that. I believe it's time to pay attention. And I don't think people pay attention enough to these four common questions that we used back then at Chronicle Publishing. We didn't use it just in our book division, we used it in all the ones because we were an aggregated company. What's your core competency? I sit down and I talk to startups at uh, O'Reilly's Strata uh, conference that Alistair Kroll actually runs for us, and they're like, data. And I'm like, really, data is your core competency? You've got to explain, you've got to really know what it is. What are your greatest owned assets? What is it you actually own? What can you do with them? What are your human and material assets? Again, people, I think, especially in startups, they do understand hiring is really important, but your people are assets and you need to think about them that way. And how do we capitalize on them? How do you take all that and capitalize on it? So what do we do? 
Some of our best sellers were from very famous people, Richard Diebenkorn, Deborah Shank, big names in the photography and the art world. We had all these legal contracts where we owned the right, the permissions, to use all of their, um, all of their designs and all of their photography, but we never did anything with it besides put it in books. So what do we do? We got creative. We sat down with Richard Diebenkort and his people and we said, look, we've got this idea. You've got all these beautiful photos. Let's put them out there in a different way. Let's not just put them in a book. At the beginning, people laughed and said, no, no, this is never going to work. But our core competency was editorial. So what do we do? We launched a new division. We called it GIFWorks. And uh, it's a really fuzzy thing because uh, a bunch of trademark stuff came down on us at the time, but I wanted you to see the original logo. It was all based on derivative works. So we took Richard Diebenkord's artwork and we put it into note cards. And we took Deborah Shank's photography and we put them into little cards that you could keep on your desk and photographs that were um, framed. But here's the funny part. We take it to our markets, which at the time were the bookstores, and we were told that we were bastardizing publishing. So, don't get me started on what I think about the bookstores um, being their worst enemy. But nobody would listen to us. There was no BISAC codes with these big, long, complicated codes that are required for shelving in bookstores. But we didn't give up. We couldn't go into our markets, so we went into others. I found a rep group that actually sold through Hallmark stores. You guys see that little precious moments thing up there? And everybody laughed at us and said, there's absolutely no way a company that delivers like that is going to sell books. Well, they took on our stuff. And not only were they able to sell books, they sold books into places that books were never sold before. William Sonoma is a really good example. Carried the very first Chronicle books in their stores. They actually went on to do their own book line because it became so successful. So once we had some success, we went back, and we went back to our own channels. The division started working, and we paid attention. So the thing that's the most important was it would have been really easy in 94, 95, 96 to like give up, as many publishing companies did at the time. So that was then. This is now. Publishing has continued to erode. We all know that. But reading has not. So Joey Ito did a, a speech at TED, I think it was a, a little while ago, saying, don't be a futurist, be a nowist. And I call it the art of paying attention. But he's right. If you're always thinking about what's going to come in the long run, again, you're not paying attention to today. So let's talk a little bit about O'Reilly, right? This very vision, mission-driven company. For those of you who don't know, our owner, Tim O'Reilly, um, is big in the technology space. People call him a futurist. Um, which is why I have a job, because I think about now. <laughs> um, we're very mission uh, and, and values driven, and we have a long-term objective, and the long-term objective is to actually build a company that survives Tim, right? We're privately held. We've been growing. We've created things. We've spun things off. We have a venture capital firm, but Tim is still at the heart of it in a lot of ways, and it's my job to try to fix that. So we had a growth model that was a book model and a conferences model, right? That's how the company was structured. Well, if we're going to try to grow this thing, we all know publishing is in decline. Our own revenue tells us publishing is in decline, right? What are we going to do? It's not about pivoting. It's about paying attention. What are your core competencies? O'Reilly is editorially competent. Our editors are some of the best technology editors on the planet. Our talent tells me that they would never publish on their own because they need the technology editors to work with them. So we know we have a core competency. We know what our assets are, right? Our talent is our asset. Our brand is our asset. Our communities that follow us are our assets. How do we capitalize on those? How do we as O'Reilly serve and capitalize on those? So what do we do? We changed our strategy. We changed our structure. We weren't about to say we're getting out of publishing. We were about to say we've got to look at it differently. So instead of calling ourselves a book publisher, we started calling ourselves a fully integrated media company. When you are structured as a product-driven organization, the only way to grow is by adding more product. You never really stop to think about how you're serving your audience. So we created something we called practice area framework. And what it is is it puts audience first. Instead of putting product first, all we did was the small change to put audience first. 
Those bubbles at the top are the different categories of audience that we have, and it's only a small sample of them, but I wanted to be representative of what we do. Notice product line is at the bottom of this. And audience development at the side, everything is done through audience development. That's what you're always paying attention to. By moving in this way, we were able to structure into smaller teams, right? Smaller teams that were really paying attention to the audience, that really cared about what they cared about, that were watching the trends that were happening there. It allowed us to create a structure to grow the business. So we flipped ourselves on our side. Remember those buckets were going up, those arrows were going up. We flipped ourselves on our side, and editorial and event production became capabilities instead of core to who we are. And we created a platform for growth. Are we still a publishing company? Yes, but publishing in its many forms. Now we've got a way to grow along the horizontal and the vertical side of the axis. We can add new capabilities, or we can add new growth areas, new practice areas, new audience segments. We never had that before as structured as a publishing company, right, and an event business. Every single one of our teams is focused on their core audience. We've got a programming audience, we have a data audience, we have a web performance and ops audience. And you can see that everything we do now through these graphics is about whatever that audience needs. And we try to unify our product strategies. But at our heart, we're still a publisher. We publish materials that technology professionals need. We're incredibly proud of it. But the business model under which we were doing that wasn't working either. We talked a few minutes ago about bookstores being their own worst enemy. People don't buy print books anymore. So O'Reilly invested in O'Reilly.com, our platform. We do a lot, uh, O'Reilly.com is our largest digital channel, where most publishers' largest digital channel is Amazon. We've built our own. But we also flipped our sales model. We said, look, we know that this is material that needs to go out to the audience. How's it going to get there if they're not going to be willing to pay for it? So what do we do? We switched up our sales model from being B to C to being B to B. So now sponsors actually allow us to drive product into market. They actually pay for product to come into market. All of what you're seeing here, this business, industry, and culture, are free reports that have been downloaded over 100,000 times because they were brought to you by the sponsors that O'Reilly has that were core to its original events business. So what, what was marketing actually became product in our new model. We've always done webcasts, we've always done e-newsletters, but now because we have a uniform approach to each practice area, we actually have sponsorship across these newsletters and across these webcasts. So a sponsor that used to pay us $30,000 to be at Strata now might pay $100,000 because they actually want to sponsor the content that O'Reilly is producing for the audience. Their logos show up at the bottom, but what's really important is it also gives those sponsors engagement all year long. What you're looking at here is an annual plan for a particular topic area and what's included month by month. Some months it's podcasts, some months it's videos, some months it's books but it's all different forms of media that allow us to talk to our audience. But let's go back to mission and driven values. O'Reilly would never sell ourselves for money. It's who we are. So we created an editorial independence policy so that those B2C customers that used to pay that now don't have to because our sponsors are paying actually know that everything that comes from O'Reilly comes from an editorial independence viewpoint. Our sponsors are never allowed to change our content, and they're never allowed to inform what's in it. So we were able to take the best of who we were, make a small change, open up a new markets for ourselves, new practice areas, quite simply because we paid attention to the assets that we have now. And O'Reilly's incredibly proud of this change. It's allowed us to grow substantially in the last couple of years. And it's funny because uh, a lot of our friends, a lot of our friends in the publishing world um, are doing incredible amounts of layoffs. Uh, competitors like Pearson and Wiley and places like that, layoff after layoff after layoff. O'Reilly is hiring and hiring and hiring by simply doing, looking at our assets, trying to figure out how to capitalize on those, paying attention to our audience, making sure that we stay editorial, 
we independent? So it's a small change. It wasn't a big change. It wasn't a big change at Chronicle Books. And too often I spend time with startups listening to them talk about everything being major, major changes, major business model changes. None of this is major. It was all quite small if you really think about it. But it drove growth and change in both of these companies that I've worked for. And I'm actually quite proud of it. The lessons, really important. You got to stay true to who you are as a company. You got to pay attention to your human and material assets, really important, and by that I mean what you own. Pay attention to what you own. Remember that small changes are really, really critical. Small changes move markets. And one of the ways that we think about that is next time you're in a bookstore and you got to walk through the front of that bookstore and 50% of that bookstore is filled with a bunch of crap, now you know who to blame for that. Thanks, everybody. Here we go. All right. Yes.